1878 that a steamship sailed up this channel and docked here in Southampton. On board was pioneer Adventist missionary William Ings. Today, this is still a busy container port and is also the home to cruise ships and pleasure craft. But for me, its importance is as home to the start of Adventist mission in Europe. In this, the 90th anniversary of the establishment of the Trans-European Division, I want to look back at some key points in that history, but also to look forward to see how the passion of those early missionaries, William Ings and John Loughborough here in England, John Mattison up in Scandinavia, and others across Europe is still being repeated today. Let's start with Richard Daly, who recently researched the early days of Adventism in the UK, producing a moving documentary. My interest really came as a result of my own personal desire to, to find out how the church began. And when I saw this information and saw the work that had taken place, I thought to myself, you know, people need to hear about this. People in the British Isles need to know how the church actually started. And, and so as a result of that, and through the process of producing this documentary, we unearthed all these fantastic uh, documents and um, the sites, original sites that we went to. And we discovered that it was through the hard work and perseverance of lay people like William Ings and Maud Sisley, who came and reached people where they were, gave out leaflets, worked unendingly, and paved the way for the first um, ordained missionary to come in 1878, um, John Loughborough. And he started with open air meetings, tent meetings, and he met with a lot of opposition and disappointment. But because of that missionary pioneer spirit that he had, he persevered, he didn't give up. In Victorian Britain, a very class uh, conscious society, a tent uh, was something associated with the circus, with the carnival, with lower class things. So middle class people would never go to a tent. One year since John Loughborough's arrival, the first Seventh-day Adventist baptism finally took place in the British Isles on Sunday, the 8th of February, 1880. Six people were immersed in the baptistry by John Loughborough in one of the lower rooms in Ravenswood. And by the end of the week, seven more were baptized bringing the first official membership of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in England to 13. Even in those early days, Ings and Loughborough saw their mission as from Southampton to the world. Ings in particular worked in these very docks, visiting the various steamers that would then distribute Adventist literature around the world. In fact, Ings was so trusted that he could gain access to the docks, even on a Sunday when the gates were generally closed. Mission is still continuing here in Southampton area today. I am with Rosemary Lethbridge. I believe you have an exciting story to share with us. You're based here and you're doing wonderful mission work. Can you share with us what is on your heart? Thank you. Well, we're very fortunate to live in this beautiful part of the country. And along with our incarnational approach to ministry, we decided to combine the two. And the result was a photographic competition where people could include all their favorite beauty spots in the area. And we produced this book, a tourist guide to Hampshire, Dorset and the Isle of Wight. But it wasn't just about journeying through beauty spots. It was also about encouraging people to explore a faith journey. And this book includes Steps to Christ. This book also gives the location of all the Adventist churches in the area and advertises Bible courses. And the idea has since been copied in other places. We're working and walking alongside people through the highs and the lows, the joys and the sorrows of their lives. This year will be our best year yet. We have three baptisms, two that have already taken place and one that's booked for next month. But we have been working and sorrowing and laughing with these people for, for 11 years. It's no quick decision, no quick fix. Which reflects the rest of Europe, isn't it? 
That's what we do. We work with God's guidance. As Christians, our our calling mm -hmm. is about helping the needy. Yes. Feeding the hungry, clothing the the, the naked, mm -hmm. and offering support to the the downtrodden. Mm -hmm. And all this includes refugee. Okay. We need to be a community of rescuers. You know, you want to do do something for your community. Now, on the 25th, we're doing a grand opening of the cafe as a One Region Community Cafe. Uh, we kept the ethos of health message that we kept as a vegetarian cafe. And we are promoting laws of health. You know, we are not only focusing on food, we are focusing on loneliness, youth, workshops, we're going to be running. Um, there's lots of people we connected through the council and the Watford Three River Trust. Ings was not the first Adventist missionary to Europe. John Andrews had passed through Southampton four years earlier on his way to Switzerland. Unofficially, Michael Chauskowski, a decade before that, brought the Adventist message to, among other places, Switzerland, Hungary, Italy, and Romania. John Matteson, who started working for Danish and Norwegian communities in Wisconsin, moved his mission directly to Norway in 1878, helping establish the church both there and in Denmark. And as the church grew, remarkable things started to happen. Let me take you to 1918, the end of World War I and civil war in Finland. Victor Stolberg lived in a small farming community 150 kilometers east of Helsinki. Three years before the war, a colporteur had knocked on his door. Victor became a Seventh-day Adventist. Victor was against fighting and tried to stop his son Vaino from getting involved. However, young and passionate Vaino ran away with friends to join the White Army. Skiing through the snow-covered woods to the coast, they were arrested by Red soldiers, taken for questioning in the local town, and then told they were being moved elsewhere for interrogation. The boys were driven on a sleigh with two soldiers, but suddenly on the sea there's three more soldiers, which ask, where are you going? To Kotka, to the nearby town. No, you're not going to Kotka. And they order the boys out of the sleigh and ask them to walk further. There they see that there is a hole on the ice that has been freshly cut. And they order the boys into a line in front of the hole. But our great uncle Vayner, he refuses that and he's shot in his head and falls dead. Later, the Whites retook the area and started to execute revenge on the Reds. One day, Victor heard that 10 Red prisoners had been brought to a hill in order to kill them as revenge for his son's murder. Rapidly grabbing his Bible, he hurried to the site. There, he started preaching the gospel and told them, now this slaughtering is enough. You cannot kill any Reds for my son's lost life. Not one. Not only were the lives of these ten men saved, but his witness led to the establishment of a house church in this very building. I believe his heart was changed by the love of Jesus that he was able to forgive. The blood of Jesus had cleansed him and touched him and made him new. And that is what carries me today the blood of Jesus, my only hope. The courage of one man made a significant difference in Finland. Even today, in perhaps the most secular of European countries, Finnish Adventists are still sharing their faith via their schools, witness projects, and outreach in both the capital and the far north. For instance, in Jakobstad, a five-hour drive north from Helsinki, the Adventist Church has been running Konstead at Leva, the Art of Life project. They are providing a variety of need-based activities in their community, from a health 
holistic perspective with the Bible as a foundation. This year, they have now started a Bible study group. Dark clouds have also shadowed Europe during our history. Yet even in those times, our members have shown resilience. In Riga, Latvia, for example, two Adventist ladies hid a Jewish boy in their first floor flat during the Nazi occupation. He later became an Adventist and a powerful soul-winning pastor. Today that heritage lives on right across the Baltic Union with church plants, health initiatives, and participation in the annual Riga Marathon, where conversations arise as they challenge, don't follow me, follow Jesus. But the Nazi challenge was nowhere more difficult than in Poland, as Richard Jankowski explains. In 1943, uh, the neighbor of my grandma went to the Nazi, to Gestapo, and she said, there are people who worship Saturday. Yes, okay. They came and took all my family to the concentrate camp. Uh, some to Auschwitz, but my grandma and her three daughters were putting to Ravensbrück. That wasn't easy, but um, uh, her daughter survived, but she didn't. So before she died, she called her daughters and she said, Daughters, be faithful to the Lord, to Jesus Christ. He's a wonderful Savior. Those were dark days during the Nazi era, then during communism. But God worked miracles then, as he does now, at a miracle campsite that generates almost 50% of the baptisms in Poland. And we like that young people, children, they love to come here. They enjoy programs, they enjoy nature. And it's so natural to say yes to Jesus. So this is my church and it's my privilege and I love it. I meet my friends. Uh, I can also develop my spiritual life. Amazing time, very blessed by God. I think mainly is the people and the atmosphere that you always have. You get the chance to really refresh your spiritual connection to God. I like, I like meeting new friends. I think everyone should do it. We have mission inside camp. We try to reach teenagers, they are the special group, but uh, we also try to go outside. Around some mission trips, uh, we take kayaks to go here and there to meet people. Uh, we have concerts uh, in, a, in a jail, we have concerts in a city, we do public evangelism with the speakers uh, somewhere in a public space. Uh, we have uh, lectures, workshops uh, in the city. I praise God for reports like this and for many more. As since the last GC session in 2015, our mission board has voted many, many hundreds of thousands of pounds for projects across our territory. This includes church planting and discipleship training. That learning becomes action, as for example in Novi Sad, Serbia, where our Adventist University students run UNZIP, an on-campus program of lectures and social programs that challenge secularized youth to re-evaluate their views on God. Students have stated, today God is forgotten, but really needed. And it is amazing that someone is finally talking about God in a relevant way. That relevance could also be seen during our largest ever Pathfinder Campari this summer in England, where 4,000 Pathfinders and leaders gained skills, fellowshiped, and worshiped together. I was inspired by the 1,200 pastors and spouses and staff at our European Pastors Council in 2018. I want to thank them for their commitment, often innovative service, as together we work to connect inspire and change. In essence, what we are seeing in committed Adventists across Europe, putting into practice our theme for this quinquennium, to connect, inspire, change. It is happening as I look back at the 90 year and history of the Trans-European Division and the longer history of Adventism in Europe. 
as I think of the sacrifices of Andrews, Ings, Loughborough, Matheson, and so many others who started the work in Europe. And then as I think of the tens of thousands who continued that work, not just here, but as missionaries in almost every corner of the planet. For this, I feel humbled. What a heritage and responsibility we bear. It reminds me of the words that Ellen White wrote, and I quote, in reviewing our past history, having traveled over every step of advance to our present standing, I can say praise God. As I see what the Lord has wrote, I am filled with astonishment and with confidence in Christ as leader. We have nothing to fear for the future, except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teachings in our past history. We will not forget, as the 14-year-old Elijah Evans, who wrote the TD Pathfinder Campari theme song, reminded us, let me tell you about God's almighty hand, reminding campers how God led the Israelites out of slavery to freedom. I resonate with the chorus of that song, the same God who was with them and is with us today. Let me When the 